And let us begin with a prayer because it's important that we hear what the Lord wants us to say when God sent Jeremiah the prophet he was a young man to preach to the people and call them to repentance because he had been living sinful lives lives and Jeremiah said I'm too young I don't know what to say and God said I will put my words in your mouth so that's what I'm hoping and asking and trusting God to do that he will put his words in my mouth we are in very perilous and difficult times and yet at the same time God wants us to be confident and not afraid as Jesus said to the apostles on the day of the resurrection resurrection be not afraid they were all locked up in the upper room afraid that maybe the Jews would the Pharisees and the scribes and so forth would stir up the Romans and get them crucified too. But Jesus appeared to them and said, do not be afraid. And our blessed mother at Fatima said, the Holy Father will have much to suffer if you do not do what I ask you to do. But she said, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. And so, even though there are many things stacked against us, we have God on our side. Or I should say, we are on God's side. And who can overcome him. God's main complaint against his chosen people was, they do not know my ways. They do not walk in my ways. He said in Psalm 81, if my people had heard me If Israel had walked in my ways, I should soon have humbled them, humbled their enemies, and laid my hand on them that troubled them. I would feed them with the best of wheat, and with honey out of the rock I would fill them. The Jews, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, had been enslaved in Egypt by the Egyptians for 430 years. God performed great miracles to move the Pharaoh to let his people go. Well, the Pharaoh was not about to do that because they had the Jews there as their slaves, serving them and growing their crops and feeding them and so on. And so the Pharaoh ignored the call of Moses. And at the hands of Moses, 10 great plagues came upon the the, uh, Egyptian people. And the Hebrew people saw all of these works of God. And they rejoiced in him, but they had a very short attention span. When Moses led the people out and they went across the Sinai Peninsula, which was not all of that long, and brought them to 
the confines of the promised land, the the land of Canaan. Moses sent um, scouts out to chart to scout the land, and the scouts came back and said, "Yes, it's a great land, full of milk and honey." But they said, "The people there are like giants. We seemed like." grasshoppers in, um, in comparison to them. He said that land, they said that land is a land that devours his people, devours the people. And so the people got terrified, totally forgetting the great miracles they had seen God perform. And the ultimate miracle when God, Moses separated the sea and they marched through that Red Sea on dry land. And then the Pharaoh and his armies came charging after them to bring them back into captivity. And the people were terrified. And Moses said, don't worry, they're going to be all gone by morning. And that night, God had Moses strike the water with his uh, rod. And the sea flowed back on the Pharaoh and his army and wiped them all out. Recently, on the internet, I saw pictures that have been taken in that area. And there are the remains of chariots at the bottom of the Red Sea. So these things really happened. And the people saw this. But when they got to the promised land and the scouts came back with that negative report, they began to wail and to cry. Why did you bring us here? totally forgetting the great miracles God had performed to set them free. If God had done all of these things to the Egyptians, couldn't he also have taken care of those giants in the promised land? They seemed like giants to the Hebrew people. Of course he could. But they didn't have the faith. They saw God's ways, but they didn't think about them. They didn't contemplate them. And above all, they didn't walk in them. And so, God, however, did not abandon them. Nevertheless, they were constantly going against God. And God said, Forty long years was I offended with that generation because they had been led around the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years after they had refused to go into the land of Canaan. So God allowed them, or he sent Moses to lead them around the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years until that whole generation died off. He said, these always there in heart, these men have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. And this was kind of the pattern of the chosen people over the centuries that followed. God sent his prophets to call them back. Years ago, he said no. Dr. Burns Seeley, who was a great help, he was the... uh, 
theologian for the Apostolate for Family Consecration for many years under Jerry Conacher. And he made a study of how the people of God had been sent prophets by God to call them back. And he discovered as he studied that there were 177 times in which God sent his prophets to the chosen people to warn them to repent of their sins and to stop sinning. Seventy times, God's people heeded the call and experienced victory over their enemies. One hundred and seven times, they ignored God's call and went on to experience great chastisements, war, defeat, destruction of their cities, pillage, rape, great suffering, exile, enslavement by their enemies. If only they would turn back. This also is a message for us here in these days. Back in the 1950s, God sent our Blessed Mother here to America, to Ohio, and also in Indiana, to a sister, member of the Precious Blood Sisters, Sister Mary Ephraim, to call the people to repent of their sins, turn back to God, to call parents, not only to prepare their children to be successes in this world, but but above all, to grow in the spiritual life. And our Blessed Mother told Sister Mary Ephraim, If people will do what I'm asking, America will be greatly blessed. But if they do not do what I ask, America will have much to suffer for a long time. It looks like that's what's happening to us now. With the way our government is now beginning to persecute the church, trying to force us to go against our consciences, to provide contraceptives and abortion for employees with the threat of great fines, crippling fines, if we do not do that. So far, Obama has held off a bit, but he's threatened to do it. It certainly looks as though we're heading into a time of great suffering. But we also have great hope, because as I said, our Blessed Mother has told us that in the end, her immaculate heart will triumph. As we said, in Psalm 81, God says, if only my people would hear my voice, if only they knew my ways and walked in my ways quickly, I would humble their enemies and lay my hands upon those who trouble them. But they don't know my ways. So that's what I would like to talk about today. What are God's ways? How do we walk in them? At Fatima, Our Lady asks that we pray the rosary every day. Why? Why pray the rosary every day? Well, as Pope Paul the sixth said many years ago, 
in his apostolic exhortation, Marialis Cultus. The rosary is a compendium, a summary of the gospel. And if you study the mysteries of the rosary and look into the gospels, you see that that is true. Because with Pope St. John Paul, who gave us the luminous mysteries, we now have four sets of mysteries that are a summary of the gospel. The joyful mysteries, the first set of these mysteries, basically lay out God's grand plan for man. God has a plan for us. A plan that when you look at it is incredible. And that plan our Blessed Lady summarizes for us in five joyful mysteries. If you look at these mysteries, you see that God wants to confer upon us a new identity and a new life. He wants to make us sharers of his own divine life. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, I came that men might have life and have life more abundantly. What is this life? This life is a life based on the new identity that God wants to give us. In the first joyful mystery, Jesus, the Son of God, becomes the son of Mary and Joseph, the son of man. Mary is the virgin mother of Jesus. Joseph is the virgin father. He was not conceived in a normal way, but in a miraculous way by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. That is why the Holy Spirit deigns to be known as the spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He is the one who made her pregnant with the Son of God. And so the Son of God became the Son of Man. The Maid of Nazareth became the Mother of God. She was the wife of Joseph, because they were betrothed. And in the Jewish culture, the betrothal actually was the marriage. Once you were betrothed, you were considered married. Not like we have it now. People get engaged, and during the engagement they say, nope, it's not going to work. So they agree to be friends in part. It was not that way with the Jews. Often, the marriages were arranged by the parents. Sometimes, the bride and the groom didn't even know each other. But they had a year to get to know each other before they would have the wedding feast and then go to live with each other. But they were married. If they decided that, no, they didn't want to be married, then they had to go through a very a regular divorce. So it was different. Mary was the spouse of Joseph. They hadn't yet celebrated the wedding feast, and we don't know whether or not they did, because Scripture doesn't tell us. But it was to Mary that the Holy Spirit came Gabriel came to announce it, and when Mary said yes, 
fiat, let it be done to me according to your word. The Spirit came upon her. We would later be members of that mystical body. And so, <clears throat> at the Annunciation, not only did the Son of God become the Son of Man, and Mary become the Mother of God, all of the future people who would believe in Jesus were given a destiny to be the sons and daughters of God. This was what was revealed to our Blessed Mother, that Jesus, her son, would be a king, and of his kingdom there would be no end. In a visitation, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, and John within her, that is, Jesus within her womb, sanctifies John. Jesus begins his work as the divine bridegroom to prepare for himself a bride without spot or wrinkle. And John would later do that. He was the first to be sanctified by Jesus from the womb of Mary. Later, God would send him to preach, to call people to repentance, to announce that Jesus was the bridegroom. Because when John was preaching, he would point out Jesus. And little by little, the people started to leave John and to follow Jesus. And John's disciples were jealous. They said, Master, everybody's going after him. And what did John say? He said, the bride goes with the bridegroom. And when the best man sees that, he rejoices. And he said, so I rejoice. He must increase, I must decrease. In other words, all of us are called not only to be the sons and daughters of God, we're called to be the bride church. And each one of us is to be a member of the bride church. In other words, each of us is to have a spousal relationship with Christ. Each of us is called to grow in our communion with Christ so that each of us will eventually begin to, in our union and communion with Jesus, share that intimate communion of mind and heart and life that Jesus shares with his bride church. It's not, it's not just for priests and religious. It's for each of you, you and me. We are called to have that deep inner communion with Jesus. In the <clears throat> Third joyful mystery. Jesus is born in a cave below Bethlehem. I've seen that cave. I was able to go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land many years ago. It's about seven years ago now. And see that cave. It's rather stark. Has almost like different rooms because it's volcanically formed. There are a lot of caves in Palestine. In any case, Jesus came into the world as the mediator. A mediator who has a threefold mission, prophet, priest, and king. 
And the Magi came. First of all came the, um, the shepherds. They were told, go to the cave because for you this night is born the Messiah, the Messiah who was called, who was prophesied. And they went and they knelt in adoration. And a little while later, the Magi representing the Gentiles came with their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, recognizing that Jesus is the prophet and the priest and the king, foretold by the prophets. But as members of his mystical body, we are called to share that identity as well. We too, each in our own way, are called to be prophets. What's a prophet? A prophet is someone who is filled with the light of God, and speaks at the inspiration of God. Each of us is called to do that, to be filled with light. And how will you be filled with light? You will be filled with light in the presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. When you come to visit him in the Blessed Sacrament, and especially perhaps to make a holy hour. It would be great if you could make a holy hour in the presence of the Lord at least once a week and be filled, be filled with the light of Christ as you sit in his presence and read his word and ask him, Jesus, what do these words mean? What do you want me to know and to understand? We are called to be a royal priesthood. This is what Paul tells us, and also Peter. In other words, what is known as the priesthood of all of the laity, because when you were united to Christ in baptism, you began to share his identity as prophet, priest, and king. And so we are called, we are called also to be members of his mystical body and to continue his work as prophet, priest, and king. We do that, as we will see, every day, or at least every time we attend Mass. We're here at Mass not just to be spectators, but to join with Christ in offering his precious blood body to the Father. In the third, I mean, the fourth joyful mystery, Jesus is presented in the temple as the great Passover lamb You recall the story of how in Egypt, on the night of the Exodus, the people were told to take a lamb, either from the sheep or from the goats, and to sacrifice it, and to roast it, and to eat its flesh. But they were to eat the flesh standing with bitter herbs ready to flee Egypt because that was the night of the tenth plague when the angel of death went into every house of the Egyptians and slew the firstborn Egyptian, the firstborn son of the Egyptians in every household, beginning with the Pharaoh's own house And that so terrified the Pharaoh that he called Moses and Aaron in and said, leave tonight. And all of the people wanted the Jews to leave. They they were afraid they were all going to be killed. 
That was the first exodus. And so it was the blood of the Passover lamb that was sprinkled on the houses of the Jews that caused the angel of death to pass over their houses. And that is why to this day, every year, the Jewish, the faithful Jewish people will celebrate the Passover. We have a new Passover. Our Passover is Jesus who makes us sharers of his identity as the great Passover lamb. He said to his apostles, I'm sending you out as lamb and sheep among wolves. All of us are called to do that. We are called to bear witness to Christ. And finally, in the fourth or fifth joyful mystery, Jesus um, goes to Jerusalem with his parents to celebrate the Passover. But then he remains in Jerusalem afterwards. And his parents, Joseph going with the men, Mary with the women, each thought that Jesus was with, the, was with the other group. Joseph thought Jesus was with the women. Mary thought Jesus was with the men. And so they went a day's journey. And they got together at the end of the day. And they both asked each other, where's Jesus? And they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And they spent three days looking for him. What was Jesus doing? He was in the temple evangelizing the rabbis. And they were amazed at his questions and at his answers. Mary and Joseph looked for Jesus for three days. They surely went to the temple. But they didn't find Jesus there because apparently Jesus had gone out to look for food precisely when they came in looking for him and they didn't find him. Well, that was arranged by the providence of God so that Jesus would have time to talk to the rabbis and get them to think and to question, is now the time? when the Messiah will manifest himself? He didn't come right out and say it, but he was planting the questions in their minds. And so he had three days to talk with the rabbis and to get them to think about these things. And we too are called, we too are called to share that work of Christ as the new Adam and the new Eve. Jesus was there as the new Adam to do his father's work. That was what he told Mary and Joseph when Mary said, son, why did you do this to us? He said, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? In other words, he was a servant of his father. Yes, a son, but also a servant. And so we have this call to share these identities. And Jesus will give these identities to us. And how will he do it? When he came, He did it by establishing the sacraments. Years ago, I had been studying the Rosary Mysteries. And for many years, I puzzled about why. In the Joyful Mysteries, we finish with the finding of Jesus in the temple. And then 
We go immediately to the sorrowful mysteries, the agony in the garden. And I always wondered, why do we jump from the finding of the temple to the agony in the garden? The question was answered when Pope St. John Paul gave us the luminous mysteries. The luminous mysteries. And the first luminous mystery, Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. He is the Son of Man. He's baptized in the Jordan. And John said, you should be baptizing me, not I baptizing you. Why? Well, because Jesus is sinless. People were being baptized, John, as a sign that they were repentant of their sins and that they were asking God's forgiveness. It was a baptism for forgiveness. But John couldn't figure it out. He said, you don't have any sins. Why would you be baptized? And Jesus said, let it be done to fulfill all justice. And so John baptized him. And as John was baptizing him, the Father's voice came from heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit came down upon him in the form of a dove. What was Jesus doing? He was giving us the matrix, the form for the sacrament of baptism. In other words, he was saying, just as I am when baptized, so each of you must be baptized. And later he sent his apostles out to preach to everyone the whole message. He said, go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I commanded you. And so... In baptism, what happens? We are given sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace makes us sons and daughters of God because sanctifying grace is the power that makes us sharers of the divine nature. As Peter says in his second epistle, by the great and glorious promises, we have been made sharers of the divine nature. Those are not the exact words, but it's a paraphrase of what Paul, Peter tells us in his second letter, chapter 1. And so God's grand plan was to make us his precious sons and daughters, and he did so in the sacrament of baptism. In baptism, he conferred upon us the identity of being his precious sons and daughters, the identity of being the brothers and sisters of the Lord. This is who you are. You are brothers and sisters of the Lord, and you know that. The problem is you might not believe it very deeply. We'll talk about that later. But in any case, baptism made us sharers of the divine nature in the sacrament of um, matrimony, Jesus makes the bride a sign and a symbol of the bride church. He makes you husbands the sign and the symbol of himself, the divine bridegroom. And he calls all of us to say, yes, you are members of the bride church. As such, you must begin to grow in holiness. Be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. You must grow through all the stages of the spiritual life, which we don't have time to go into here. In the 
third um, luminous mystery, Jesus, the new Adam, calls all men to repentance. He preaches the good news that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the kingdom which had been prophesied by the prophets is now beginning. And he calls everyone to repent of their sins. And he lays, therefore, the groundwork for the sacrament of reconciliation and the anointing of the sick. Because in, that, in those sacraments, especially the anointing, or especially the sacrament of reconciliation, Jesus comes as the new Adam to share with us, to free us from sin, to liberate us, but also to make us servants of God with him. As the Son of God, Jesus is equal to his Father in every way. But he also saw himself as the servant of God because he said, the Son of Man did not come down from heaven to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And finally, in the fifth a luminous mystery. Jesus, or pardon me, the, the fourth luminous mystery. Jesus is transfigured on Mount Tabor. And this was in preparation for his coming passion and death when he was to give the ultimate witness to the truth. You recall that when Jesus was standing before Pilate, scourged, crowned with thorns, Pilate said, so you're a king? And Jesus said, you say I'm a king. But he said, the reason I came was to bear witness to the truth. And it was as a witness to the truth that infuriated the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The scribes and the Pharisees were enemies of the Sadducees but they came together to plot Jesus' death. Why? Because he was bearing witness to the truth. And it was as a witness to the truth that he was crucified. We are called likewise. And in the sacrament of confirmation, we are made witnesses to the truth with Jesus because as Jesus said to the apostles on the day of the resurrection he said stay here in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the father he said not many days hence you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit a second baptism the first baptism was with water the second baptism would be in fire and the Holy Spirit, as Luke had, as Jesus had foretold in Luke's gospel. And that is what happened. On Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon them. He took away all their fear. And they went out and bore witness to Christ. The Second Vatican Council says, that all of the graces of Pentecost that were given to the apostles and the disciples, the followers of Jesus on Pentecost, are given to us in the sacrament of confirmation. So in the sacrament of confirmation, Jesus and the Holy Spirit make us and confer upon us the identity of being witnesses for Christ. That's who we are but we may not yet feel ready to do that. We'll talk about that later. And finally, in the fifth joyful mystery, <clears throat> Jesus was in the temple 
bearing witness. But in the fifth luminous mystery, Jesus establishes the Eucharistic mysteries as the sacramental expression of the Passover mysteries. And in these mysteries, he makes us sharers in his work as prophet, priest, and king. As I mentioned earlier, you become a prophet the more you are filled with the light of Christ. And the more you share that life, that light with others, you share with them what you have received. As priests, we attend Mass, not merely as spectators, but to offer with the priests and with Jesus himself, Jesus' own body and blood to the Father in reparation for our sins, in adoration of his divine majesty, in praise and thanksgiving for all of his love and benefits, and in petition for all that he wants to give us. And so this is how we share in the priesthood of Christ. And as kings, we share in his, we share in his royalty by being servants with him to help build up the church, by receiving the Eucharist. The Eucharist is called Holy Communion. Why is it called Holy Communion? Because that's the grace it gives us to grow in an inner communion with Christ, a communion of mind and heart and life. When you receive Holy Communion, and especially remember this today, when you receive Jesus, ask him, Jesus, help me to have that communion with you that you want to have with me. Not just what I want to have with you, but to have that deep inner communion with you that you want to have with me. A communion in which you will make me your instrument to help build up the church, your mystical body. Yes, that's what we're called to be. But we can't do it by ourselves. As Jesus said in John 15, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so, yes, we need to ask Jesus, help me to abide in you so that, so that you can abide in me. You can then begin to speak in me and through me and to touch other people, to be in a way incarnate once again in my human flesh so that it will be, as Paul says to the Galatians, no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. That's what Jesus wants to do. To be in you so much, to have such a deep communion with you, that it will no longer be you who live, it will be Jesus living in you. Jesus reaching out and touching others, serving others, helping them, helping you to grow in your own understanding and appreciation of who you are and of who your brothers and sisters are. And so now we need to get ready to celebrate Holy Mass.